All set? So I'm Govan Bailey from Queen's University in Kingston, if you weren't here last night. Um, first of all, uh, fantastic PowerPoints, very professional delivery. I was very impressed. Uh, it makes me feel a bit lazy. Um, so thank you for four wonderful talks, which I also enjoyed reading because I read them in advance. I do want to make a plug here, a shout out for Queen's University. We have a very important uh, graduate student um, conference every year in January. Of course, it's Canada in January, but um, you'll get warmth inside. Um, it's very big. We're, we're now up to three days long, and we get people from all over the place, so really uh, Europe and all over the U.S. and Canada. So um, please apply. It's, it's run entirely by our grad students. We do not deign to tell them what to do, and uh, each year there's a theme, so it has a particular theme. So please think about that for next January. So it was interesting to see the commonalities in these papers, um, even though they were from quite dramatically different periods. Um, all of them, it seemed to me, had to do, to a certain degree, with participation with the viewer, not just looking, but um, moving this idea of kinetic art that uh, Lauren was talking about. I found this very interesting, this interaction between the artworks and people, real people. We have a coffret, and I hope that's how you say it. Is it? Yep. We have a coffret um, which is uh, read aloud, sorry, which, is, which you open and close, which you move around, hand to your partner, and she hands it back that you sort of um, um, have to be tactile with um, and manipulate to get the message. We also have a cross, which is meant to be read aloud, uh, which is an aspect of performance. Uh, you also process around it, which is, again, a performance. It, it involves active looking and active participation. Um, and it's only through this processing around it that you begin to understand the figures and, and to decipher the meaning. Uh, and we also have these frescoes in these staircases. I'm very jealous. I wish I could get into those staircases, um, but uh, good for you, wonderful. Um, we get these, uh, these paintings in staircases um, in the most important palace in Christendom uh, in which you, you move through, you, you pass by these uh, in, in sort of daily routine. Uh, and encounter these these frescoes. So they're part of a motion again, because I mean, when you go up a staircase, you are processing, you are moving. So again, another uh, connection between kinetic and, um, and art. And then these bronze statues, these wonderful statues who attentively serve you uh, and, and relate to you and, and uh, work within, uh, participate in your daily ritual and your wonderfully loose dinner parties. Along with participation, often comes meditation. We have an engaging with an engage an engaging with an engagement box. Well, it is an engagement box. It's given as an engagement present. So we have someone engaging with their engagement box um, as an interactive contemplation upon the relationship between earthly and divine love. Um, we have a cross which demands viewers of different levels, and here we get a bit of reception theory in here, of different levels of education uh, and ability and non-ability to read, for example, to uh, meditate upon the nature of kingship and its relationship to Christ's passion and Christ's overcoming worldly kingship with its loss of faith, uh, loss of faith with um, um, divine resurrection. Um, and this is a kind of walking meditation. As we meditate on these scenes, we actually have to walk around the cross and we have to see it from all sides. So again, this kinetic aspect. And potentially, although this is a stretch, given the loose nature of Roman banquets, a contemplation of service, perhaps, an attentiveness as, a, as an idea, a meditation upon attentiveness, 
um, and also the relationship between art and life in antiquity, uh, by which I mean Greece specifically, and with contemporary life. So uh, in this case, engaging more with connoisseurship and with, uh, with, uh, also with cultural values. And then speaking of walking meditation, these Gregory the, the 13th frescoes being in these staircases that people are moving by was something that, that uh, also connected with meditation. I, mean, I just chose random order here. I want to just speak first about Lauren's uh, talk. Um, what comes immediately to mind uh, is the nearly contemporary movement called Devotio Moderna, which also took place in Northern Europe, Netherlands and, and uh, uh, Northern Europe uh, in the 14th century, so around the same time as the Coffret, um, and its application to art. So this idea of focusing on the inner devotions uh, and short periods of meditation, but using artworks, whether paintings or objects, as a prompt to meditation, which is precisely what this box is doing. So I'm thinking there must be, uh, is there, I'm not a specialist in that period, but is there perhaps a climate of uh, Devotio Moderna uh, type meditation that might um, connect with that box, that might enliven it? Um, this, this idea of active meditation using an artwork as a prompt. Um, Caitlin's talk, uh, very interesting how you use reception theory uh, to the cross and look at the ways in which different kinds of people interpret it. Um, you also look at, look at issues of hybridity, which someone who works in post-colonial stuff, I find uh, very interesting because it's almost exclusively used in these later periods and in particularly in post-colonial theory. But here we have a very good example of pre-Christian beliefs and talking stones and screaming stones being incorporated uh, into uh, these beliefs about kingship and, and ideas about kingship. So they interact with Christian ones. I would also like to learn more about the kinds of procession that passed around this cross. What did people do specifically with this cross? How did they engage with it physically? And also perhaps this relationship to liturgy, to what was going on in the church across from it. It is sort of like an outdoor rood screen in a sense that you go past it and get into the church. I lived for several years in Northeast Scotland, and so I personally am intrigued with parallels in that part of the world. I, I lived on a farm surrounded by stone circles, by recumbent stones, and by fantastic picture stones. In fact, I was a five minute walk from the famous Maiden Stone. And just are there parallels in, in the Pictish world that might be worth exploring? Um, Tiffany, I would like to know how these individual scenes related specifically to space. You talk about relations to past cycles, to other art forms, but how did they work in those space? Was there a specific choice to have particular scenes from Peter's life in particular staircases? The reason I ask is that in some Cinquecento Roman uh, fresco cycles, that was a very important thing. I'm thinking particularly the novitiate, uh, the novitiate chapel, recreation room, and hospital at San Andrea al Quirinale, um, which are no longer there but are described in great detail, in which uh, the, the imagery in the frescoes connects with what you do in a particular room. And in fact, hallways and staircases were places that depicted scenes that involved travel, that involved moving. So there was a distinct connection there. So that's something I was just um, interested in hearing more about. Also, you said that interesting thing about activating the capital of earlier popes and, and how it's not a copy. That's something that, that's very deliberate as a way of legitimizing your rule. And it brought to mind what I was talking about yesterday. Uh, someone actually was also asking questions about is uh, Juan Christophe's palace a copy or is it something else? But Juan Christophe was very consciously imitating the court and, uh, and, and the ideals of Louis XIV. So it was, uh, it, he was using the uh, capital, in this case, of an earlier king to legitimize his rule. Um, Yes, so this walking meditation through these staircases, something like Zen walking meditation, um, 
it fascinates me. Perhaps there is no relationship in this case, but there are in other ones. Daniel, uh, a fascinating case of repurposing religious or at least commemorative art, whether we're talking about Apollo, Apollo or a, 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 an athlete, for example, for a domestic personal function. As you mentioned, iconography is less important. And this is interesting, just because we are so focused on iconography in this field. Uh, but I was intrigued by the issue of style and connoisseurship. Very specific archaizing styles were chosen, and in one case, in the house of a collector of Greek antiquities. How did owners play with style? And it was a very playful thing, I think, too. Very, you know, it, it was done with wit. Uh, to arrive at just the right attentive figure for your own personal setting and for your own dinner party? What were you trying to communicate through style specifically? Um, and you, you made that interesting point about the, fig the figural language inherent in Greek sculpture made Greek sculpture uh, um, appropriate for this role. So that was interesting too. Uh, I've just been told I'm to shut up, but just I'll be brief. Um, and one name that didn't come up in your presentation, but I thought of right away was Pygmalion. You're talking about using uh, or taking a sculpture and making it come alive, returning our own view with your attentiveness, sort of uh, the, the Pygmalion idea. Um, so I think I would like to, on that note, um, hand it over to the floor, and I think I sit there, and we just do we just open it up to questions, or how does that work? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> All right. Let's do that. So I can take questions. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think actually, I don't think you're supposed to press the button, you just try it. Is it? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I think um, a lot actually has been made of their nudity in terms of um, the eroticism of certain actual slaves that the Romans kept, uh, little boys, del uh, the puer delicatus, and that the, these somehow are that's the immediate kind of social meaning that's residing in these statues. But as you say, not many of them have been reconstructed with their trays except for the one, this one, which he doesn't actually have his tray top. But when they have the trays, the whole, yeah, that whole region is sort of covered up um, and they look very statue-like despite that. And it also sort of eradicates the the one in the center has been, it's been talked about how his contrapposto is a little bit too uh, plucky, like that's not how Greek statues would have looked and it's a, it's a Roman sort of riff on contrapposto and it's exaggerated, but um, with the trays, these big sort of bulky 
tray structures, a lot of that gets kind of covered up. And I think that's why style, I mean, I'm not sure how to account for the difference of style other than, I mean, personal taste is one way to account for the very archaizing boy with these other sorts of heirloom uh, objects that were found in the house. And I think a boy who looked like he was doing something tray-like and um, could be equipped with it was what they wanted. And obviously we have this aspect that these are Greek statues. Um, so they operated on a, on a variety of appeals to Greek artistic history, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that I did that Photoshop. It looks ridiculous, but um, <laughs> those are actually real er Aratine, that's Roman Aratine wear. So I just wanted a contrast with his um, skin, but they, it looks like they're cartoons, but they're not. That one lives over there. Um, so scholars don't actually know for sure what was put into the boxes, and there's a debate if they actually served as engagement presents at all. That's the, the general scholarly consensus, but there are a couple um, academics in Germany uh, in, in particular who push back on that and say that there isn't enough evidence um, even though almost all of these boxes, they have, you know, they show um, the type of imagery that would be appropriate for courtly love and these, these, you know, kinds of processes and gestures. Um, but so most scholars think because this this box is quite small, and so they think it could have ha held um, small trinkets, jewelry pendants that um, were exchanged between the two individuals in, in the couple. Um, uh, but I mean, once it was in, um, set in to the chamber and it was kept after, you know, like the, um, they, you know, got, got engaged and then they were married. I imagine uh, a host of other small things, small, small personal things that meant something to the individual who owned the box could be placed inside of it. Um, and I'm actually going to the Met in a week to look at this box, so I'm going um, to pay close attention to the paint and where it is worn, and um, these, all these images are from their sight and they're excellent. And you can see um, definitely that it has been used. And um, so I think that uh, it, it does speak of it being, you know, held. And, and I mean, I, I mean, cause it's a box. You can't use a box unless you like, you know, hold and move and, 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 and open it. So I definitely think that this, this shows um, Use, but I'm I'm also happy that you can still see um, some of the paint and gilding. Um, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? To this? Do you have any sense of how, what kind of percentage? I mean, there are many boxes like this made of many different materials. Mm -hmm. Let's say between 1,300 and 1,500. Just pick a span. Uh, how often do they have locks? That's a good question. Um, it, well, and a problem with that too is what locks are original and what locks aren't. And that's actually something that I'm trying to grapple with right now. I can't give you a good estimate at this, uh, at this precise time because it's still something that I'm trying to actively uh, go through, but... Um, for my dissertation, I'm interested in the boxes that have, have imagery underneath the lid, and there's a constellation of 18 boxes that have, have images underneath the lid, and um, all of them, I'm pretty sure, do have locks, but this is the only one that has a heart-shaped lock. And from what I understand, they think the heart is, the, the, the heart is, is original, but the other... Um, you can't see it, but on, on like the corners and stuff on the outside, all of that, that iron is not. And um, yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. And that's, that's a question that I'm going to be 
exploring as, as I continue working. The back end. Maybe we could use the Nerf uh, yeah. microphone here. So I feel like I'm talking into one of those uh, cups <laughs> that, that in your photo reconstruction. Uh, first, I, th I just wanted to say that I think that art history is in really good hands by the evidence of all four papers this morning. Really quite splendid. Uh, so uh, I would like to hear the answers to some of Professor Bailey's questions. Uh, perhaps we could start with Tiffany's because I was thinking as well as you uh, had your different locations of the stair frescoes and the different locations of the rooms, very specific rooms, quite far apart, and whether there's any textual evidence, particularly in the earlier guidebooks, that would give you some inkling as to whether these had an adjacency program or a progression through the palace program? Thank you for that question. It's hot. I know. Um, the answer to this, I think, if we go back to the slide where we have um, the two, it's in the room of the Sala degli um, Vecchia Svizzeri, which is essentially the old room of the Swiss Guard. Um, the Zari paints, one more, one more forward, this one. Um, in terms of programs, so you have essentially what is um, the calling of Peter and then the introduction slash naming of Peter. This is where the old Swiss guard kept um, their <coughs> battlements, their guards and wares, um, and all their equipment is stored here. So in essence, one of the things that I think is, is very interesting about the way the narrative builds is that if you were a Swiss Guard member, you're reinforcing this idea of Peter being called, you are being called. You are being named under Peter, you will, you will serve under Peter. So there's that very implicit connection. The other side of this is thinking about what Dr. Cooper is saying is that they're spread apart. Now, here's the problem. So the f earlier text, so before Shatard and Taya, when they're walking through the palace, they're very disjointed. So it points back to the problem of the spectatorship, which is who would have had access to this and who would have been able to see it. The ceremonial route that you would have anticipated exiting the basilica, you would have seen the Soproporto, which is the exact biography that I found in the Vatican archive. So a person who is just kind of coming to the palace, they're going to see Gregory, whether they have a papal audience or they themselves are entertaining the court, instantly they would have theoretically started in St. Peter's, walked out, seen the Acts of the Apostles across the top, walked around the front, gone through the Scala Regia, hit the Scala del Marcialo, but in turning to go towards the Capella Palena, you should have theoretically seen the washing of the feet, a last supper on the opposite side of that, and the tribute money, which kind of would have been fascinating because it's reinforcing these ideas of servitude, but also the distinction between church and state. And if we think about Gregory's pontificate at this point, Spain is weighing heavily, and in fact, it is Spain who actually elects him during his conclave. Um, they kind of blindside Cardinal Farnese, who thinks he's going to get it. Spain's like, there's no chance. Find someone else. So he has to kind of run to the Medici and be like, okay, who will you vote for? And they're like, yeah, we'll take the Bon Compagnie. And they're like, fine, just, just elect him. In a way, this need to distinguish papal primacy from what is this problematic relationship with the empire can be thought of through these stairs, which is again reinforced in the medals that what represents Peter and his identity is filtered through the lens of apostolic primacy as discipleship. 
And remember, you have a choice now. You can be Roman Catholic or you can not be Roman Catholic. And in framing this debate about identity theory, essentially, of Roman Catholicism, the steers themselves are saying, like, what's at stake now in being Roman Catholic? As opposed to, if you back up and think about even the Sistina, the way the Sistina works typologically to think of Christ and Moses, it's very heavy handed. You see that giving of the keys right in the middle and it is staged with such beautiful one point perspective to really hit you over the head. He's the one in charge. You start seeing even with Leo X and the, and the um, tapestries, a more nuanced approach. That even something that is the charge to Peter, as opposed to the giving of the keys, is taking a little bit of a step back to think more about how they're framing their identity. Um, so when you get even later to Gregory the Thirteenth, there is this moment where saying "I am in charge" is no longer needed as such an abrupt statement. But I'm in charge because look at what all of my predecessors have done. Look at what I have inherited, essentially. Um, the other question that goes back to you, which is like, how on earth did you find these? Or um, there could be more. Yeah, I was wondering there could you, very well you be said more. All the staircases and all the staircases. Yeah, so you have to think about the stairs that are going to the Raphael Loggia, the stairs that are going around the side to what it would be the front of Bramante's stairs. Um, Essentially, in the 18th century, when the palace is reconfigured, those staircases are drastically renovated. So today, if you were to go look for these stairs, like the ones I show in the photographs, it's a coat closet. Like, when you go through, you, wouldn't, you would have no idea this is a program. Eventually, the goal is to go back with, um, with Todd Murder and take what is essentially Chatard and Taya and walk with Vitaly Zonkatine the exact layout that is described and say, okay, there should be an image here, that's a door, what's on the other side? Or, or where are there potentially missing images? I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think. Um, so you had a number of questions all over the place that I talk about in my dissertation, so I'm, I'm happy to answer all of them. I'll start with Scotland, I guess, because that's sure, the closest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so there are there are crosses there, of course. Um, they they are pulled down much more in the Protestant Reformation. So and but in Ireland that happened, but just not as much. And and in Ireland they were actually in the Protestant heavy areas. They're moved inside the churches. So it's interesting about controlling that. Yeah, in Ireland. And they weren't meant to be, but they were moved into the churches. Um, I mean, it, ju it, it just came out of me traveling around Ireland and not being able to get access to some of them for the, uh, the Catholic areas. They're all, you know, they're outside and they're in cow pastures and things like that. But yeah, the Protestant churches, they're in there. Um, in Scotland, picture stones, um, primarily they do have a lot of martial imagery um, and they're, they're weird and they're cool. Um, but yeah, um, and uh, a lot, there's, there's a lot of hunting scenes and warrior scenes, um, particularly crosses. The Dublin cross is one that's probably closest to the cross of the scriptures. Um, it has an inscription of Constantine. There was a Constantine. There was a Scottish king. Um, and it's in, in the valley of Strathern. Um, and it may have kind of marked boundaries in a similar way and claimed, kinglish, but they, um, claimed kingship, but um, they, that kind of ruling dynasty got wiped out by the Vikings. Um, the Ruthwell cross, um, I mentioned, it has the, the inscriptions going around around it of, um, in ruins. Um, and the Gosforth cross, which is interesting when you spoke about hybridity, um, because it's a cross that also has scenes from Ragnarok on it. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a Viking kind of area that that was in. And that takes me over to your area of specialty. Um, previous research that I've, I've completed is on the atrial crosses of um, New Spain. And I'm, I, yeah, so it actually came out of a seminar class um, with Monica Dominguez Torres. Um, so it was comparing how these have been studied methodologically. Um, and I would say something like the cross of the scriptures, um, it's not right, it's, you know, it's 900. It's not right when Christianity came. They're still kind of figuring out things, but not to the, the extent of, of New Spain where, um, I was talking about it earlier with someone. There's like a Judas scorpion. Um, they use obsidian in their crosses. Um, it's just an area that's untapped. And but that studying that helped bring insight to how I'm approaching high crosses. 
And what primarily came out of it is site specificity um, and locality because none of these crosses have been cracked per se. Um, there's not been really a full reading that's based on a textual account. It's very piecemeal and you're tr we're trying to figure it out and put them together. Um, the cross of the scriptures is unique in that um, we, it's tied to a person, right, and probably a date. Um, Klamak Noise was a center of learning, and there's a lot written on it. Um, and not all the crosses are, are like that. Um, so I was able to write so much on it. Um, and usually they are thought of primarily devotional. Um, in the very beginning, just purely didactic. I mean, the cross of the scriptures, right, that you thought illiterate medieval people were just oh, I'm going to learn the gospel stories, right? Um, no, they're, they're familiar with it. Um, and it is at a monastery. Um, but So I'm trying to break away with that with the inscription and, and, and read about kingship into that. Um, how the ceremonies would have been kind of... is The only thing I really know um, is that there is um, a tradition of going clockwise around the sites. Yeah, it, Dishel. Dish means right in Irish, um, and so you would you would proceed around the site or the object three times, and so you still see some of that. Yeah, three times. Uh, three was a, a sacred number, and you see it a lot. There's a lot of uh, triads, and um, um, even back into kind of older Irish things, the threefold deaths heroes would have, and things like that. So it, it's three in Ireland. Um, and probably the Trinity, right? It was it yeah. placed into that. And there's also, it's not in this image, there's three crosses at the site. Um, uh, sorry, I should have, it's probably in the big over screen version of it. Um, yeah, you can't see them because there's a lot of crosses now. There were three crosses, were three crosses at the site. Um, no, um, a separate. The other two have very kind of. They're they're dominated by non-figural. There's a couple images. There's a crucifixion. Um, I mean, they could have thought of that later, but it's it's not necessarily you know hitting you over the head with it. Um, but there are still kind of ceremonies where you would process entirely around the site. Um, and when you get to the cross, I would say um, because the inscription is at the the shaft, um, the the base of it, it would be kneeling. So you would look at that straight on when you were praying. Um, so I can't really answer more to the liturgy um, other than the scholars have tried to attempt to read it by following the sun and how it progressed around the day and perhaps that's a way of reading it. Um, people have done things with like water and blood and <laughs> all these different things. But every cross is different and unique to its site and so that's kind of where I'm trying to dig into the, the placement of where it's at. And this one, all at all of these borders, um, and having a name of a king and um, him possibly being on it is what spoke to me for this one. And since you mentioned those ones in Mexico, I mean, they were all counterclockwise because the Aztec tradition before that was to process counterclockwise. Counterclock yeah, counterclockwise. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, they're they're. Perhaps it's a. I don't know. Um, I, I I think like Ireland when I talked about kind of the the stone like. The, it, this doesn't happen um, elsewhere. There's not. That's the only comparable body of stone crosses that I have seen, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's. I think it's happening in these two places. I don't think they're exactly related at all. But I think that they both have this strong tradition of stonework, um, and and this and this respect for it. And they kind of already have the skills in a way, um, especially in, in New Spain, um, and this idea that this is part of this, um, that that's why it emerged. Also, um, a fun note, in New Spain, um, there was a decree. They used to be made out of wood, but they kept getting like hit by lightning or falling over. And so they're like, we're going to make these out of stone now, so people stop questioning that. Um, Irish scholars have been increasingly <laughs> trying to figure out, um, did the, were there wooden precedents before that? Why did this happen? But we have the answer for New Spain, which is great. Um, we don't for you. No, it's oh, just, uh, they, 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 they resemble um, wooden crosses with kind of metal work and things like that, or metal crosses, yeah. Um, I always assumed that they were a transference from one Yeah, that's, that's, that's the most commonly, you know, I mean, yeah, these, all these examples. Um, the Vikings, other Irish people burning sites. I, th I think you said yesterday it's hard to destroy a, a stone city. It is. it is very hard to destroy a stone cross and a stone, stone cross. yeah. So I think, you know, all of those different things, and they had the power and the wealth at this time all mm -hmm. coming up. So, sorry, very long answer to all those three Thank questions. Thank you. Oh, yeah, how, how are we doing on time? Okay. 
Um, okay, wrap it up. Um, yeah, so your question was about connoisseurship. Yeah. Um, so I actually think that these statues speak to something that's not very connoisseurial in the sense that we understand it as knowing dates and named period styles and artists. I mean, I, I spoke about them in those terms because that's how we understand them in terms of modern art history, but I think this Roman response to what the statue look like they're doing and then we're going to, I think you were right to say that it's a, it was a playful sort of response. Um, I mean, it's a, yeah, I think Roman connoisseurship is a difficult thing to pin down because the only texts we have are rhetoricians sort of comparing visual styles to rhetorical styles and... Heavy stuff. Yeah, um, so to say, I, I'm not, I think these are elusive in terms of um, the how the Romans were looking at Greek art. I would say it's not connoisseurship, but something, a popular response to a deep-seated desire to fill one's life with the signs of Greek culture. Um, a Greek antiquarian who knows his connoisseurship? Well, I mean, <clears throat> he, I mean, the, we have a couple of those archaizing things, and some of those other ones may not have been tray bearers, but the, uh, the, the old idea about that archaizing one is that he looks sort of like he should be holding something, um, and the archaic style as being sort of more statue-like, more object-like than human-like, so. That's an important point right there. Right, um, but yeah, so a, a fascinating response to Greek statue that I would say is not very connoisseurial in any way that we understand it. Okay, I'll be super fast. Um, yeah, you are exactly right in um, that there are uh, a lot of instances in the contemporaneous uh, culture in that, at that time um, when the caskets are being made. I mean, these, these types of objects, I mean, they, they are meant to be moved, meant to be used, and you have, have this in, in a lot of different kinds of objects, a lot of different kinds of um, things that people would, would, would have known um, the, uh, the way they move through books, the way they move through churches and different sites. And it's just, it's, it's, it's such a part of that, of that culture. And a big part of my dissertation is to look in, um, uh, um, or, or trying to look at these boxes in, in a way, um, in their cultural context that, that, that hasn't been done before to, to, to try to expand how they would have, you know, would, would, would have spoken to, to other things that, that, that are happening at that time because these, these boxes, the, um, they, as I said, they haven't gotten a lot of attention. Um, most of the time uh, when people um, do speak of them, it's just like small, you know, blurbs in, in, in um, exhibition catalogs. And it's just, no one has taken the time since like the 20s, Heinrich Kohlhausen, German scholarship to even like his 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 book is the only one that has ever been done on 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 all of all of these containers and all the ones that I am kind of like, you know, trying to bring together in in my project, it's they they haven't ever all been brought together. Um and so yes, yeah, so I'm 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 trying to tie them in, in into things that 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 you you have brought up and 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 other yeah, things happening. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Using things as prompts. Yeah. And yeah. Are you going to pick this up? Are you going to get to open it, pick it up? I hope so. Because that that's actually pretty important, I would think. Well, I've been. If you're wearing the white gloves, I think you need to pick it up. <laughs> I. I hope so. There's um, a box that I'm being allowed to see that's been on loan there for a very long time, and I'm, I, I've already been told I'm not allowed to touch it. So that's that's. But this one. This one, I'm not sure yet. Well, this, I uh, yeah, I hope so. I I hope so too. This the the other box that I'm I'm, I'm going to see. It's all scenes from the life of the Virgin, yeah. and um, Her, uh, Harry Bober a long time ago. Um, he just made a small um, a comment in an exhibition catalog that he said um, it might be a 3D hours of the Virgin, and 
no one has like taken that and done anything with it. And I think that's kind of an, an important observation for how these boxes would work that just has been like completely ignored. And, 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 and this, this other box, the one that I'm not allowed to touch, it was probably made in the same area, possibly by the same um, artist as this box. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to knit all these things together, yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we're done.